going to start a new section of Scripture, and that's going to be the book of John, the first John, written by the Apostle John. I'm going to take just and try to handle just the first four verses tonight. We come to Scripture, there's a different ways, different methods to, to look at Scripture, and I love to do a book study. We did that with James, and uh, often I do little different things morning and night. And the book of 1 John brings us some tremendous truths from God's Word. It brings us truths about God's love. Chapter 3 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed. It brings us a concept of love that, that we love Him because He first loved us. Bring us brings us a concept of confession and forgiveness. If we confess our sins, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, it talks to us about, about worldliness and fleshliness. It says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, found in 1 John, just jam-packed with some tremendous truths. It brings us security in, in salvation. In, in chapter 5, verse 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Oh, and it ends, it ends with a great challenge, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Boy, we read that one, the ending of 1 John, and we're quick to, to skip over the idols. Well, we don't have any idols in America. We don't have any, any false gods in America. We, we don't have any false gods except the dollar. When this becomes more real to us than God himself, it's an idol. He says, keep yourselves from idols. Oh, 1 John is packed with some tremendous truths. It's packed with some, some challenging concepts. He, he mentions what it looks like to live a sinless life in chapter number 2. We'll look at that when we get there. Then he makes the, the assumption that we probably will mess up, so we have an advocate with the Father. His name is Jesus Christ the righteous. It's found in 1 John. John, who is, who was the beloved disciple. John, who, who Jesus told other things to that he didn't tell the other disciples. In fact, at the Last Supper, Jesus tells all the disciples, he says that one of you is going to betray me. They begin to ask, you can look it up later on, they begin to ask the question of the Lord, who is it, who is it, is it I, is it I, is it I? Peter leans over to John, you can read this in the gospel, he leans over to John and, and Peter says, John, you ask Jesus because he'll tell you. John then asks him and Jesus makes this statement, he who dips the sop with me, you know that passage, right, who dips the sop with me, the same shall betray me. Well, a little while after that, Judas walks out. We know that he did not tell everybody because the other disciples supposed him to go handle the money and do something with the poor. If they had heard what Jesus had told John, they would have known he was the one to betray, but they didn't know that. And so Jesus told John some things that, that some other disciples didn't know. We come to 1 John, and John, as he opens this up, begins with some tremendous truths. In 1933, April of 1933 it was, that the Loch Ness Monster was sighted for the very first time, igniting the modern legend. Hit the newspapers on May the 2nd. And they relate an account of a local couple who claimed to have seen an enormous animal rolling and plunging on the surface. The story of a, a monster, the moniker chosen by the newspaper that day, the Courier Editor, becomes at that point a media phenomenon. With London newspapers and sending correspondence to Scotland in a circus offering a 20,000 pound sterling reward for capture of the beast. After that, April of 1933, the sighting was reported, interest steadily grew, especially after another couple claimed to have seen the same animal on land. They began to investigate in the 1960s, several British universities launched sonar ex expeditions to the lake and nothing conclusive was found. But in each expedition, the sonar operators detected some type of large, moving underwater object. In 1975, another expedition combined sonar and underwater photography in Loch Ness, and a photo resulted that, after enhancement, appeared to show what vaguely resembled the giant flipper of an aquatic animal. How many have seen a, quote, picture of the Loch Ness Monster? Are they not all blurry and fuzzy? And if you look at it, it reminds me of one of those things they used to have in newspapers in the back, one of those 3D optical illusions. That when you looked at the back of the newspaper and you crossed your eyes and held it just right, something would magically appear. 
Or it's kind of like the current cloud game where you look at the sky, you look at the clouds, and you see an animal in the clouds. Everyone sees a different animal because it's all in our perception. So those pictures the Loch Ness Monster look, at, look like. Revelations in 1994 say that most likely the photo in 1934 was a complete hoax. Surprise, surprise. But it's neither dampened nor hurt the enthusiasm of tourists and investigators for the legendary beast called the Loch Ness Monster. What if I told you that last night I saw Bigfoot at my house? What if I told you that? Well, what would you say? Would you say, wow, that's tremendous, Pastor Howe. He's a reputable guy, and, and he normally tells the truth that we know about. So if he says he saw Bigfoot, then he probably saw Bigfoot. Or would you say, okay, Pastor Howe, what's the joke here? You know Bigfoot's not real. What if I told you last night I saw a UFO outside my house? And it burned a crop circle in my garden. You'd say, okay, Pastor Howell, okay, you're a normally reputable guy. You, you had the story about Bigfoot. Now you're bringing the UFO to the situation. You may be a little cuckoo. And what if I told you that King Kong also showed up last night at my house? And I'd say, Pastor Howell, whatever you ate last night, don't eat that again. Because, my friend, those mushrooms that you picked from your backyard were not normal mushrooms. <laughs> Leave the mushrooms alone. But what if I told you that I saw God himself. You'd say, okay, that's not true. There's a phenomenon going on right now where people have said that they have died and gone to heaven. Maybe you've heard some of these things. A man wrote a book a few years back. I believe they made a motion picture about it. I don't know. Um, but he wrote a book about 90 minutes in heaven. And, and other people have, have said these things that they have died and gone to heaven. And the problem that I have with this, just to teach you a little bit about this, is that anyone who truly believes biblical revelation, uh, it's almost impossible to not resist the conclusion that these modern testimonies have with their relentless self-focus and relatively scant attention they pay to the glory of God. Because God is glorified in the Scripture, but not in these books or in these other simply stories. And they're either figments of a human imagination or, or dreams, hallucinations, false memories, fantasies, or even deliberate lies. The Bible says that, that uh, in Proverbs, who can ascend into heaven? And then it answers that in John chapter 13, Jesus said, And no man hath ascended up into heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. The only one who has gone to heaven and come back from heaven is Jesus Christ himself. You say, well, these people were very, very convincing. I hate to break it to you, but Jesus himself said he's the only one who's gone to heaven and come back from that. We look at 1 John, and John tells us that he saw God. Current day, UFO, Loch Ness, King Kong, Bigfoot, we say, John, you're nuts. You've lost your marbles. You must be on something. You're a sincere guy. I like you, John, but you're just not telling the truth. I want to look tonight about this particular, this particular topic, what we have, you can have. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what we'll look at tonight, Lord. Guide us and direct us in this time. Lord, turn our hearts toward your scripture and the truth there. Help me to say those things that are honest and according to your scripture and word, Lord, and challenge us and change us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 John chapter number, number 1, and verse number 1, the Bible reads, look at it with me, please. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, or... Um, which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. About four times in the Scripture, and in John, you'll see this particular phrase, and these things write we unto you. He gives us one of the purposes here. But I want to look at those first couple of verses, because I see, first of all, a declared authority. A declared authority. It talks about authority in the testimony or an authority that's given to us. 
There's an authority in an eternal person. He says, that which was from the beginning. There's an eternal person, that which was from the beginning. John presents his case, his testimony, and says, I want to introduce you to somebody that was from the beginning. It sounds strangely like how he introduces another book, the book of God, John, the gospel of John, which when he, when he said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He introduces to us the Alpha and Omega, that which was from the beginning, the Word of life. John presents to us this concept. He goes, I'm going to talk to you about somebody, and this particular person I want to present is eternal. He was from the beginning. There was no beginning. Before everything was, he is. This is the person I want to present to you. If he was in modern day and said, listen, I saw the biggest creature I ever saw, we'd say you're nuts. But John says, I want to introduce you to somebody that had no beginning, that was before you and I, before this whole thing, the eternal person. But he goes on. And I see an embodied person. Because in verse number two, he says, For the life was manifested. It was revealed to us. Two times in verse two, he uses this word, manifested at the beginning of the verse and at the end of the verse. He, want us, he wants us to know for sure that Jesus Christ, this person, this word of life, came in the flesh and was revealed unto us. John wants you and I to know that Jesus Christ, him that was from the beginning, called the word of life and the word in the, in the gospel of John, was revealed by flesh to us in this world. First Timothy, Paul says this, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. It's a very important truth that we believe in, that we hinge our salvation upon, and that is the manifestation of God in the form of Jesus Christ. Very important doctrinal truth, and John presents that to us. He says, listen, this person I'm presenting was from the beginning, and he actually came to earth. You say, John, you're making this up. John says, I couldn't make this up. John, you've lost your mind. He said, I've not lost my mind. This God, this eternal being, came here and he walked and he talked. He was manifested. You say, why is that important, Pastor Howell? Because the Bible promises that Jesus would come to earth. And if he hadn't come, then the Bible would be lying. If the Bible was lying, then your salvation is a, is a fraud, is a farce. You're wasting your time, I'm wasting my time. It is a very important truth that we understand, and John presents it to us in verse 1 and 2 of 1 John, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Say, well, John, why should I believe you? Because not only do I see the authority in the testimony, I see the authority in the witness. John begins to present to us why he is a credible witness, why he can talk to us about this. If first of all, we see this. He says, we observed it with our eyes. If you look in the Bible, I'd like you to look in verse 1. He says, we have seen with our eyes. Later on in verse 1, two lines down, which we have looked upon. How do you look upon something? With your, help me, with your eyes. Verse number 2, uh, for the life was manifested and we have, help me, seen it with our eyes. You see with your eyes, right? And in verse number 3, that which we have seen and heard reclaimed unto you. Four different times in the first three verses, John presents this concept that he saw this person. He saw it with his own two eyes. Now, with our kids growing up, we do sometimes, when they were smaller, we played this game, I spy with my eyes. Right? How many played I spy game before? How many dads have played and tried to pick the most impossible thing ever when you're driving a car to waste as much time as possible on the trip? Guilty, guilty. I spy something green. Well, what was it after an hour and a half of driving? Oh, it's the second letter in, in, the, in, the, in the tract under, under the Bible over there, okay? Oh, Dad, we never could see that. I know, but we're not an hour and a half down the road. You've, you've not asked me, are we there yet for an hour and a half? It's a wonderful thing. I spy with our eyes. Someone locates an object, and everyone else assumes that they can also see the same thing, that it's a real object. John presents this concept. He says, listen, this person who was manifest in the flesh, let me tell you why I'm credible, because I saw it. I saw him. And he says it four times in three verses, not an accident. 
I saw it. I saw it. We saw it. We saw it. But he goes on. Not only did he observe it with his eyes, he says that we've touched him. Verse number one, which we have looked upon the end of the verse, and our hands have handled. Our hands have handled. You know, sometimes the way time works, we don't recognize the importance of something until it's past. After Christmas, you may reflect and meditate on the Christmas time and say, boy, that was a wonderful Christmas. Boy, that was just special. And, and often, inside of that time, you don't, you don't experience or don't appreciate it as much until it's all over. I wonder if, if John is reflecting some here and he says, listen, not only have we seen it, our, our hands have handled I wonder if at this moment he's reflecting back upon the time when he stood on that mount when Christ rose back into heaven and he thought, I've touched the Son of God. I wonder if there's a time that, that he helped him off the boat. I imagine there would be. I imagine those men would help each other off the boat and he said, I helped the Son of Man off a boat. I wonder if there's a time that, that he brought food for Jesus Christ. Well, the Bible does not record them eating much. You know they had to eat because it was an anomaly when Jesus didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights. You wonder if he thought back about the time when he brought Christ a loaf of bread. Maybe he even gave him a hug. I imagine that they would have done that. The Bible talks about greeting one another with a holy kiss. There was some, some Greek and, and some Jewish tendencies of affection. I wonder if after the resurrection, when they gathered at first, Christ said, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended. But I wonder if later on that there was some embracing, some, some friendship, monikers of friendship. And John says, not only have we seen this, I'm credible because I've touched him. I've actually touched the Son of God. But he goes on, he says, we've observed with our eyes, we've touched with our hands, and we've heard with our ears. Verse number three, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. You see, our eyes can be fooled. Maybe you've seen optical illusions before. You've seen the one with the black lines and white lines, and they say, how big is this room? And you're like, wow, it looks like it's not the same shape and size, but actually it is. It's just your eyes play tricks on you. Now, our hands can be fooled, and and uh, perhaps you've, you've touched something and thought it was sharp and it wasn't. Your hands can be fooled and your ears can definitely be fooled. But, but, but John says, listen here, our eyes, our hands, and our ears all support the same thing. We are credible witnesses. Let's suppose for a moment that you're on trial for robbing a bank. You're sitting there before the judge, and, and you have an attorney by your side, and the prosecuting attorney comes and says, listen, you know, I know that J.D. Howell robbed this bank. The evidence proves it. And then my lawyer gets up and says, yes, but we have a witness. And they are an eyewitness. A witness that produces for him an alibi. Not only was he with this individual, they also uh, touched him and they, they gave him a hug and, and they heard him preach. In fact, it was a Sunday morning, he was at church, and in fact, there's a whole group of people who heard and saw and shook his hand as he went out the door. It was impossible for him, for him to rob that bank because he was at church Sunday morning. If all of you were here this morning were my alibi and my witness, and the judge asked the first person, did you see Pastor Howell? Yes, I heard him, I saw him, and I shook his hand, I touched him. How about you, sir? I heard him, I saw him, and I touched him. How many people would they have to get to before I was exonerated? The 25th person, he preached on this, and I shook his hand at the door, and, and then I saw him up there. I, I heard his sermon, he preached on this, and I walked out the side door. I didn't shake his hand, I wanted to avoid him, but I heard him. And, and, and I saw him, but then I fell asleep, and then I shook him, his hand on the way back, so I only got two out of the three down. You see, John says, oh, I am a credible witness because we saw, we heard, and we touched. This person, Jesus Christ, came in the flesh, the word of life, dwelt among us, and we are credible. John presents us with the word of life by a credible witness. Not only does he bring authority, but he declares a purpose. You say, that's great, Pastor Howell. It's wonderful that John's a witness. That's, that's really nice. I'm glad for that wonderful truth. But John begins to tell us why he set us up that way. 
He says, these things which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. Verse number three. You see, John begins to say, listen, here's the purpose. Here's the point. I, I read it this way. First of all, he presents a real relationship so you can have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father. You see, John says, listen here, the point of Christ coming to earth was so that you can have fellowship, not so that we could have fellowship, so you can have fellowship. John does not present this fellowship as a past tense. He presents, he presents it as a present reality. You see, the fellowship with Jesus Christ and the Father is a present tense reality. The problem is that we get stuck in our automated lists. I'm talking to Christians right now. They say one of the most successful marketing campaigns of all time was the man who added one word. If you turn your shampoo bottle around tonight and look at the back, you'll most likely see three words. Lather, rinse, and repeat. They say that the man who came up with that has literally made millions for the shampoo companies. I don't know if that's true or not, but it sounds interesting. How many have followed those instructions before and lather, rinse, and repeated because that's what the can said or the jar or the, the plastic bottle said? Unfortunately, that's how we often attack our spirituality. Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, repeat. Read my Bible, pray, repeat. Be nice, love my wife, honor my husband, repeat. That is not the way that this is supposed to be. John doesn't say, listen, here's what I declare unto you, do this and repeat. Does he? I don't see that word in there. It's not in the Greek, by the way. He doesn't say, listen, here's a great list to have this fellowship. No, he says, listen, this person, Jesus Christ from the beginning, the word of life, was here on earth manifest in the flesh. We saw it, we touched it, and we heard it. And listen to us, we declare it unto you so you can have fellowship, so you can have a real relationship. What does a real relationship look like? Looks like communication. Looks like thoughts being exchanged. It looks like trust. It look like, looks like gifts being given. I have a relationship, I hope, with my wife. She has thoughts, I have thoughts. Sometimes I share my thoughts, usually she shares her thoughts. I give gifts, she gives gifts. I try to do nice things for her, and she tries to do nice things for me. And we have a relationship. But how sterile would it be if I said, okay, good morning, Doreen. It is good to see you today. Have an excellent day. I love you. And don't do anything else till the next morning. Good morning, Doreen. It's great to see you today. How often do we get stuck in that list, though? Lather, rinse, repeat. How about trying to do some good gifts for the Father, some good things to the Father? He wants to do good things for us. He wants us to have a real relationship, a real fellowship. He wants to commune with us. He wants to communicate with us, and he wants to do things back and forth with us. That's what John is talking about. He says your fellowship ought to be with, with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And when you have this, verse number 4, these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Not only real relationship, real rejoicing. Jesus said this in John chapter 15, These things have I spoken to you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. How full is your joy? See, this is where John's going in the first four verses. He says, let me present to you this person, Jesus Christ. He came in the flesh, the word of life. We saw it, we heard it, we touched it. We declare it unto you so you can have a fellowship with him. And if you have a fellowship with him, your joy will be full. But I know a lot of downhearted Christians. I know a lot of discouraged Christians. I know a lot of down-in-the-mouth Christians. Christians who claim to have a relationship with Jesus Christ but have zero joy. Pastor Howell, my joy is deep. So deep, you'll never see it. It flows from within, and there is a fountain of my joy brimming over the top. Baloney. Baloney. 
I looked up this word joy to see what it meant. It doesn't mean deep-seated happiness. You know what it means? Joy. <laughs> Smile. Amen. And John says this. He says, these things have I written unto you that your joy may be full. I looked up the word full. You know, some people tell you that what the Bible says, it doesn't really say. Uh, in, in the uh, lexicon, that's a, the Greek dictionary for Greek words, they, they said this, they used this, the, these words, overflowing. To the cup, to the top of the brim of the cup. Do, do you know what full looks like? It's what I used to do to my dad when I filled up his glass to tease him. I'd fill it up so much so he couldn't pick it up without spilling. That, that, that's how full it's supposed to be. How much joy are you supposed to have in your fellowship with Jesus? So much so that it spills over the top. How much joy should we experience when we come to our devotions? So much joy that we can't wait to spend time with the God of the universe. That's how much joy. How much joy should there be when we go to pray? So much so that we can't stop praying. That's why Paul says in Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. Think of that time when you started dating. Couldn't get enough of that person. Couldn't wait to talk to them. My wife and I first started dating. She was working some crazy hours, worked two jobs. She got off work about 11 o'clock or so some nights, and I'd get on the phone with her, and we'd talk till, oh, the Lord knows when, sometime in the morning. I'd come dragging myself into work, and Pastor Scott would ask me, oh, how late were you on the phone with Doreen last night? None of your business. <laughs> See, John says... Listen, when you have fellowship, you're going to have joy. Amen. And if you don't have joy, then you're not having fellowship. That's what he's presenting to us. What I'm saying, Christian, is if there's not joy in your life, then you need to check your fellowship. But Pastor Howell, I, I, I'm lather, rinse, repeat. I got that down. I do it every Sunday, and every day I do the same thing. Yeah, that's not the way this Christian life's supposed to be. It's about a relationship. It's about getting up in the morning and saying, God, would you speak to me today? God, as I pray, what should I pray for today? God, would you do something in my life today? God, what can I do for you today? If you ask him that question, he'll answer it. He might have a coworker that needs the gospel today or tomorrow at work. It may be a neighbor who you can do a good deed for. It may be a poor person you can help. It may be a tire chain changed by the side of the road. Listen, you do good things for the Lord because it's a relationship. It's not just a system. John says, if you do these things, these things have I written unto you, the right one to you, that your joy may be full. I'm kind of tired of down-in-the-mouth Christians. I'm kind of tired of this mentality, oh, it's hard living for God. It's not hard living for God, it's hard living for the devil. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus said, the best way is the way that I give to you. Follow me. I'll do great things through you. I'll do things which you can't even ask or think. That's what Jesus promises us. That's the relationship, and that's what John says. Your joy will be full. So, Christian, is your joy full? See, he goes one step further. There's one other concept in verse number four. When he says, in these things write we unto you. You see, John grabbed one more concept, and that is that what we have, you can have too. John says, what I have, you can have. You see, this gospel of Jesus Christ was never made just for me or just for you. It was made for everybody. The gospel is not made for me to just live in myself. It's made for me to share with somebody else. That's what John said, I write these things so that you can have what I have, what we have, you can have. And Christian, not only should your joy be full, your moniker should be the same thing. What I have, what we have, you can have. To your coworker, what I have, you can have. The problem is you don't have joy, so what you have, they don't want. Why would they want that? Well, it must be great being a Christian when you let the joy of the Lord come inside your life, like John talks about, what you have, they're going to want. Man, 
What is with you guys? What is wrong with your kids? They're happy. We don't see that these days. They take the young fishermen off into a restaurant on uh, the little soul winners, third through sixth graders, on Wednesday nights during the school year. And often we get asked the question, man, what are all these young people doing here? And, and, and they're respectful and they're nice. Well, it's because the Lord's in their heart. He's doing something. You see, when your joy is full, you can say to other people, what I have, you can have as well. You see, what John was so passionate about telling us, we are too often apathetic about sharing. Why was it real to John? He saw it. He touched it. He heard it. He saw the miracles and it was real to him. But it can be no less real to you and to me. Maybe we can't shake the Lord's hand today. We can still see his miracles. We can still hear from him as he speaks to us through his word. John didn't, John didn't have a Bible. We have a Bible. Maybe we, can't, maybe we can't see him do the same casting out of the devils or, or putting uh, uh, dirt on someone's eyes, clay on their eyes, so they can see. But God is no less real. We can see his miracles all around us, working every day. We just sang the song, How Great Thou Art. And John says there ought to be joy right here. If there's not joy, there's no fellowship. And if you have the joy, it'll be contagious, and you'll be talking about it. That's where John begins the book. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, you've done so much for me, my family. Lord, beyond that, you've done so much for all of us. I wonder who would say, Pastor Howell, I need to, I need to change my relationship with God. I don't have that joy that John mentions. My joy is not full. My joy seems to be empty. Would you pray for me that, that I can get back in fellowship with God? Because if that fellowship is there, you will have the joy. You would say, Pastor Howell, would you pray for me that, that I'll get back close to God so the joy can come back? Who would say that to me tonight? Would you pray for me, Pastor Howell? Lord, touch my heart. Amen. Well, I'd say amen. 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 I want the joy of God in my life, and that comes from the fellowship. Amen. Amen. Who else? Amen. 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 Who else? That's me. Amen. One who would say, Pastor Howell, I need to be faithful in, in sharing that with other people. I'm not nearly so passionate as John is about that. And I have that joy, but I've been I've not been sharing it like I ought to. Would you pray for me that I can share it with others? I the Lord put someone on my heart tonight, maybe a friend, a co-worker, maybe a neighbor. Would you pray for me? Amen. 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 Hands all over. Amen. Amen. Lord, you've seen these hands. Lord, you know what you want and what you can do in our heart and our life. Lord, would we come back to you, not just be in the system of repeating, Lord, but in close fellowship and communion with you. Lord, may we share it with others. In Jesus' name, amen.